stars of animation are shining. It's time to stay tuned. And now, here's your host, Bill Mackey. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Stay Tuned Live, an all-new live stream talk show presented by Streaming the Magic right here on Facebook. My name is Phil Maki, and I'm an animator, cartoonist, and a former Disney cast member, and it is my pleasure to be your host each week as we deep dive into the world of animated films. Before the show starts tonight, I'd... Uh, like to first of all say thank you again for being here on streaming the magic thanks so much and if you're interested in telling everybody about, about this great show please feel free to share this show with anyone and tag them and all that good stuff so thank you for for spreading the word out there uh, i genuinely appreciate it and i also want to let you know um there's a way that you can connect with other fans of this show uh, and you can tap into the latest news from the animation world it's the Stay Tuned community page, and uh, you can be a part of it right now by simply going to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Stay Tuners. Okay, so as you know, animation is all about timing, and it's oh so appropriate then that my Emmy-winning special guest tonight has made a career as a timing director. He's also a man with an incredible first name, Phil Cummings. Phil, not uh, not this Phil, but the other Phil, is here to talk about the multitude of animated series he's been a part of over the years and uh, to get a closer look uh, into the importance of a timing director. So, ladies and gentlemen, Phil Cummings. Hey. <laughs> just, in, just in case I'm the only one, you know? Well, I need to have a I need to have an applause button. I need to have some sort of a applause track. There's there's, there's got to be uh, oh, really th that'd be really helpful, I think, or maybe just to make that it would just be fun. It would be you yeah. know that you could like have like buttons that said like laugh and applause and I, I would oh. that would be great. That would be great, and maybe <laughs> even a few uh, like fart buttons and all those got kinds of things. Oh. You can Who used to do that? Somebody used to do that. Fart person used to do that. No, no. I, somebody had a show where they actually did like their own sound effects. They would add like they oh. would, they would do the track. But I forget I who. A chime. I heard a chime sound effect. That was impressive. Oh, that yeah. I should should I like leave and go like close the door so you can't. No, hear? I don't, that's going to go off. Uh, I, I thought it was very appropriate. We were talking about uh, about uh, sound effects, and then right. there was a sound effect that happened. I yeah. thought that was. Good. So anyway, so w w welcome, Phil. Welcome to <laughs> welcome to Stay Tuned Live. How are you? Glad to be here. Thank you. I'm glad to have you. So. Uh, you know, when I think about um, timing in relation to a cartoon, it sparks a lot of things in my mind. I think about dialogue. I think about music. I think about episode length. Um, but is there a succinct way to sum up the job itself? Yeah, it's it's acting. And it, it would be like, it would be like being an, an uh, assistant director on a live action set where, okay. where I say, okay, when he drops the plate, you walk through and you take slow steps. And then you tell the guy that he drops the plate when, you know, you're, you're nailing down everything that happens in the shot exactly when it happens and trying to coordinate it and make it work with anything else that's going on like the the background action the music what anything that there is that involves time the camera zooming in the background panning all of it is that that's are there it. people under are there are there timing underlings are there or is it just the timing director and there's nobody no, else who's the it? timing director i mean i hate to say this the timing director is the underling the, the supervising oh. director is telling you this is what i want and and okay. it's you know it the job has like super changed uh, susan could you close the door please the the job has changed from film to digital as everybody's job has changed from film to digital it sure. used to get three storyboard panels for a scene that kind of like where it starts the key action and where it ends up and you did something that was called slugging 
because they didn't even know how, you know, they would board it. They would do the script, record the track, board it, and then turn it over to people to slug to see how long each scene was actually going to take, how long it took for the action in each scene to play out. Um, what but, slugging means to, to, to break well, it down to its face? Slug, slug in film meant that you would slug it. You would say this scene is three feet, eight frames, and add all the scenes up. And the editor, one, once that was approved, once they made it the correct length, the editor would take blank film and create a slug reel. And you're sing. measuring that in feet, you said? You're measuring animation in feet? Yeah, there's 24 frames per, per second, 16 frames per foot. It's the old... Um, uh, 30, 30, 32. It's, you know there's going to be math involved tonight, Phil, because that was not part of my plan. Math is really part of it. Uh, it's, it's the old, uh, uh, format. Got it. 16 millimeter and 35 millimeters. I, you know, this is like old age attacking me the, in 35 millimeter film, which set all the standards for what we do. It's 24 frames per foot. And are 16 frames per foot, 24 frames a second. You're basically the timing. They would create a slug reel of blank slug. And as the scenes came in and film, they would, they would replace the slug with film. Uh -huh. Okay. They called it slugging. And a lot of times you would get dialogue and the storyboard and come up with a rough slug, which would tell them, were they short? Were they long? What did they have to do to kind of make, you know, in those days, it, you know, you were locked into your 22 minutes. I mean, whatever the yeah. network told you to, to come up with, that was it. That was, that was your time. Basically, it's a series of placeholders. And then as work gets further completed, it would, it would get put in, but also they had to like, you know, you recorded the dialogue off the script and then you, you had the, people the timer slugging it right and if it was like 26 minutes somebody had to like get rid of that four minutes if it was 18 minutes somebody had to come up with the other four minutes you know so yeah. that was a part of it that got replaced when they realized they could do quick times in the the director and the little quick time guy could sit in post and put the quick time together and they, they would, they would slug it. They will. I mean, now that's what happens now. They slug it now and you get the show to length. You get, you, it used to be, you could add and subtract and all that kind of stuff. Now, now you're basically locked into the time for each scene. If you have a problem, you have to go to the director and say like, this is impossible. But I, but met, I met with like, like streaming, streaming service. I imagine that they had that, 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 Serious table now. Wait, wait. The, your the sound dropped out. I didn't hear the question. I was saying, I, was saying I, I imagine now that we're doing the streaming services thing instead of direct to TV, maybe there's a little bit more give now, or are they still? Absolutely. Oh yeah. There's, but basically, you really are locked in to to change the time the time of scenes on the screen. Is a you know you can't just say like yeah let's do that. Let's see what they come up with. Okay. Uh, it's every, I, everything is so much more um, bureaucratized. Oh, uh, that's good to know. <laughs> um, it's a lot more exact now. Okay. In uh, in di analog film, it was a lot more hit and miss. They they were willing to. There was some play. Was was uh, was this a job that you? set out to do i mean was it like man i can't wait to be, be a timing director one day or is it something that you kind of fell into along the way i was, I, I started out in tv okay as a, well first as a painter then as an assistant and then as an animator and then i started when i got into effects i kind of got into um commercials and rock videos and all that kind of stuff and and features. I was on. I was on the feature crew of Fern Gully. I don't know if you. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, very familiar with Fern Gully. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, a friend of mine, was the lead 
assistant animator, the last assistant job I did. Remember the little DNA molecules in Jurassic Park? Uh, yes, you're talking to the biggest Jurassic Park fan there is. <laughs> Okay, well, me and I think two other assistants assisted uh, who animated it. I well, anyway, the the uh, the one of the animators said like, you know what, man, don't go back to features. Features are like there are not going to be any more feature crew. <laughs> Computers are gonna are gonna like screw that completely. So, uh, are you telling me you animated Mr. DNA? Is that what you're telling me? Something like that, yeah. Okay, that's pretty cool. And the, and the dinosaurs it turned into. I, I did the in-betweens. I did the assistant work. I didn't animate it. Okay. And uh, he said, like, there is no future in features. They're all going to be computers. You'll be screwed. And But I'm going over to Rocco. But that was 1992. Yeah. So there were features that came out after that. Were they just saying, just be prepared, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be phasing out kind of thing? Yeah. Uh, the last feature I worked on was Cool World. Oh, oh yeah. You know, and, and again, I mean, I was doing effects and I loved doing effects. I really did love doing effects. Um, but it just seemed like once once I started doing timing, it was it was the job of my it was my I found my true love. What about it spoke to you? Um, that you were acting that you had a lot of the the whole putting together of the time of the film it's really satisfying when it finally works when you see something that you've done that it's more satisfying than than anything i don't know i, I imagine it feels like uh like clicking something in like something into place into a notch and then, yeah. and, then, yeah. and, then and then right there yeah and and Again, you you have I mean frame by frame you have you're acting it is acting it, it's it and that really is I'm it's fun. But it's the, fun. the timing director is the I mean is the animator the actor or is the timing director the actor or, or is everybody the actor? Uh, the timing director is basically giving keying the animators to uh, telling them exactly because they need to know if there's a lot of stuff going on in a scene. Yeah. They and they don't have time to sit back and listen to where the accents are, to where you know things have to come together on on a certain frame, right? And, uh, you know, if there's a lot of stuff going on, interactions, things moving in the background, all that kind of stuff. If where's the camera move, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff has to has to be figured out. And um, it all has to work together. There's, there's, you know, so you're, you're kind of providing the, the skeleton of a scene. Okay. So yeah, I, I, I want to mention real quickly, cause you've worked on some of my favorite series out there. Um, but I kind of wanted to start by talking a little bit about uh, Adventure Time because Adventure okay. Time, such yep. a, uh, when it came out, it was such a groundbreaking show. Um, and, and I mean, it's, yeah, it's it's weird. I, you know, you get I I had no idea. I, you know, my friend Don Judge said, I need you to help me uh, work on work on. Do you want to pick up some freelance on on the show called Adventure Time? I was like, fine. OK. And I'm uh, working on it. My daughter comes in and goes, well, what are you working on? And I said, some show called Adventure Time. Have you ever heard of it? She goes, my cat's named Finnegan. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was digging it. I, I liked it. I think that was like the first episode that I worked on. And I got more and more into it because it had a whole bunch of stuff that was not in most shows. No, the combination of elements were, was really weird. Uh, the How, how um, conversational the characters would speak, but at the same time, there was all this phraseology that was unique to the show. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. There was a lot that was unique to the show. I think that, that, I mean, they had some really amazing writers, uh, Penn, yeah. who I never knew. I know I, you know, I think I shook his hand once. Um, you know, it was, it was just one of those unique ideas, but it also had a kind of, uh, Cinematically, it was different. The cuts are much longer than yeah. most. 
They are. Uh, kind of, yeah. That's kind of harkening back to like older stuff, wouldn't you say? Uh, yes, but in a way that it w- w- was unique to itself, and and also the concepts. I mean, the the whole kind of it's so. Uh, what's the word? It's not you know the the basic TV show, the basic film is still a Greek play. You're the audience. You're sitting in the you're sitting in the theater watching people work things out on stage. And Adventure Time is so not that. the The point of view of each scene is kind of different than than that. I mean, yeah, it it has it has to preserve that. But uh, no, it's it's a really unique show. I mean, I you know, I was I was a schlepper on that one that the you know don don is really exacting and he would you would sit down for 300 feet which is not really that much footage right with it with like four pages of notes he knew exactly what he was looking for was Um, that before or after things started changing uh transitioning in this digital age like was that way after way after after yeah uh, I mean, Adventure Time was was you know just a few years ago. Things yeah. really started to change at the end of the '90s. Okay, so what what was the what sort of ways did your job change then in in, in, in the at the end of the '90s, going from the, the old way to doing it the new way? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, um, it started changing, and first that there was no slugging. Uh, Second, that the cuts are shorter. Um, the uh, I I don't know. I mean, I can't. I I. It's it's hard. There, you started getting like once once they started doing uh, storyboards in Storyboard Pro and not drawing them. You started getting a lot more panels, and that that really. Um, that changed that changed everything really i for timing the main thing was that all of a sudden you're getting instead of three panels in the scene you're getting 30. oh okay Uh, to where now it's it's there's a point where a lot of shows are dropping timing they're so they're they're doing less animation now well the timing if there's a if there's a panel every 12 frames or and more sometimes uh, and it's all cut in in uh, in QuickTime. It you hardly even need animators anymore because it, it really, there's not a huge amount of leeway. You know, I mean, what what am I timing? I was I was just on a show where where they were talking about like, oh, you missed something by two frames. It's like, wow, okay, a twelfth of a second off. I mean, gulp. You know, uh, <laughs> and and that'll make the, uh, enough of a difference, would you say? Uh, what, just between you and me, no. <laughs> <laughs> yep, no one else is paying attention right now. Just, just you and me. Um, I, you know, I used to when when uh, when they first started giving us, you know, it used to be they would give you a storyboard and an audio tape that you put in your little audio tape player to listen for the accents and the acting. And yeah. then they started giving us like VHS. Whoa, so cool. On like Duckman. And I would go home and put in Duckman. And all it was was the storyboard panels with the dialogue played over it. And my kids would go like, how come this isn't in color? They didn't see that the lips weren't in sync. They didn't see any of it. They just, all that they saw was the show. Okay. And if the weird thing about streaming now is a lot of times it goes out of sync and it bugs me. If things are four frames out of sync, it makes me nuts and people don't see it. Why do you think that's happening? It has to do with, with the technology or something else? That has to do with the audio and the video being on different different aspects of the stream. Uh, you're, you're saying that they're when they're finishing the cartoon at the studio, it's fine over there, but when we're getting it at home, that's where it's falling out of sync. Yeah, uh, it it falls out of sync more often on uh, regular TV, um, but there uh, there's a lot of times where 
you're looking at something and that you just think, oh, this is out of sight. I have wondered that a lot. I've actually wondered <laughs> like, how did someone not catch this? But but that you're making me think that maybe they did catch it. It's just the they way it's catch it. It's not it's it's you know, think of how many different places it has to go before it gets to your house. So if you play something on a DVD, that's going to be a more accurate representation. Of oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. There, okay. There's no way that if that's how to sync your DVD player is broken. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that, well, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Invader Zim actually. And maybe, okay. maybe how that, uh, maybe how that was, was a little bit different if at all for you. Um, with uh, again, that, that was, I mean, they're, they're all different. The, yeah. the good ones are different. The bad ones are different. Zim, he had a really clear idea of where he wanted to go and of how that, I mean, in this one, they wanted fast acting. They wanted, they wanted the, I mean, look at these scenes that we're looking at now. Yeah. Actions are really snappy. They're really fast. They're, you know, bam, that just happened in six frames. That was. Like, the dialogue is very, very. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, whereas Adventure Time, if you think of the clips you just showed, that was all very fluid and and, and languid. And here, like, zip. The, sure. you know, every, the camera moves are, are real quick. Uh, every, everything is pretty snappy and fast. And that's that's what he wanted. That's That was why, you know, he did that for a certain effect. And it worked. I mean, on that show, it absolutely worked. And as a matter of fact, if this is the... This is... Uh, what episode is this? Oh, this is Tack, the Hideous New Girl. I might, I might have actually worked on this one. I only worked one one season on this. This is towards the end, I believe. This is episode twenty. Yeah, but um, so so with when there's a show that's being, um, how do I phrase this? So when when a showrunner is trying to communicate to everybody, because I imagine like the pacing is coming from the top down, right? Like the the decision of how the the show will be paced. Basically, yeah. So. I mean, is there a lot of uh, hey, it's it's going to be like this old standard, or is it more like no, you're gonna you're gonna know what it's like after episode one, and then from there on, that's going to be the the gold standard for the rest of the series. By the time it gets into timing, there's a timing supervisor who's basically who you've worked with usually on a whole bunch of shows that knows exactly what to tell you, and then you start putting it down on the sheets and the sheets. I mean, I don't know if people uh, actually know what, what sheets look like on me. You have some sheets. Yeah. Oh, let's see some sheets. Um, here's an exposure sheet. And let me, ah. uh, it's, it's basically like a, a bar sheet in music. Yes. There's 24 frames. That's one second. Three of those little bars are 24 frames. Uh, one one foot is 16. There's two of them. Uh, the entire sheet is five feet. If I can stop going back and forth. The entire sheet is, is five feet. Um, so you, you time it and you turn it in. And the timing supervisor and the director and all that look at it and go like, no, I don't like what you're doing. Or yes, this is this got exactly, you know, it's like you're in a band, right? And you're okay. playing the clarinet or so, something like that. You know, it all has to kind of be in sync with the rest of the team, with the feel of the show and catch what they want each scene to say. And so, um, and there's there with, with saying that there's people who are frame positive, they want certain things to be happening at exactly the right time and they have it in their mind. Then there are people who want a lot of input. You say like, you know, wouldn't it be better if he did this at this time? Or I saw the accent being this word. And I mean, there's all kinds of different stuff, you know, 
in some shows, if you add thumbnail poses that are on the board, they think, Mwah, perfect, great. If they're, if you do that on other shows, you'll get fired because they do not want you, you know, improvising and adding, adding stuff. You know, they have it in their minds exactly what they want to tell the animators to do. And as a lot of the people now have never been animators and certainly never been in, been assistants and certainly have never worked on footage, which is what all the Asian studios do. You get paid by the foot, not by the hour. And when you get like these incredibly complex Baroque exposure sheets, you know what they're doing. You know, you know, they're taking, they're turning the storyboard into layouts and they're sitting the layouts down and they're going, I got to pay my rent this week. Uh, let's see, let's make this work. And usually simplifying things, by the way, is usually better. Uh, you know, they're like, how can we make this work? And st I still make $10 an hour. So you're saying they pad out a scene as far as how many drawings are happening so that they can get paid more? No, the opposite. Yeah. Less, when you're sitting there, they call it, they used to call it pencil mileage. The less pencil mileage you do, the more money you make. And you can see some of the scenes where when after it's come back, when you're watching it in color, where you think like, yeah, they did not follow the ridiculous things they were told to do. They because they're, you know, I mean, they're cutting corners. Uh, they're simplifying. That's not cutting corners. Si simplifying is making something work with the least amount of effort. Well, let's give an example. So let's say a character is supposed to jump from point A to point B, but in between the jump, he's supposed to do like a three quarter turn spiral. Are you saying they'll make it a one spiral? <laughs> um, it depends on what medium they're working in. Oh. If they're, because if you're twirling, Mm -hmm. I mean, in After Effects, you just set a rotation yeah. and, uh, you know, I mean, all you have to do is five drawings for that scene for what you just did. Right. There's the, the antic popping up, twirling and the, and landing. I mean, not five drawings, but a, a few drawings. At least, at least seven to eight, probably about that. Right. And I, you know, I mean, we used to do it when we were working on Scooby in the seventies where you would get there. There was one animator named Ed Love who did the most beautiful stuff. The guy was, you know, worked at Disney. He was like, uh, uh, you know, um, and they used to give his work. They would say, I'm giving you 25 feet of Ed's and 200 feet of eye blanks. So, you know, and you, there was, I remember one scene where, where it was uh, Justice League, where an octopus had all eight of them and was swinging them around, right? Sure. And you think like, shit, this, this scene pays a hundred bucks. It's going to take me three days. Nobody wants to work for three days on something that pays a hundred bucks, uh, you know? And so I made little cycles where they kind of went up and down and their little arms waved. I made it like into a, a 16 drawing cycle, you know, overlapping the, the cycles and all that. It went straight through. It worked, but it wasn't, I mean, if I had been on staff, you know, at Disney and do, expected to do 10 drawings a day, I would have made that look beautiful, but you can't. And it's, I don't think a lot of these kind of people that have gone through college and have never sat at a desk drawing understand the mentality of doing that. And that that is actually a problem. They don't understand the mentality of, of, of the logistics of once you're, once you're like doing it for hire, how that changes things you mean? Exactly. So yeah. was, was that, was that a goal was going to Disney since you, you mentioned uh, the differences between the studios was going there a goal for you at one point? You know, Disney was always a step down. If you were an animator, you became an assistant animator and a pay cut. And um, one, one of the, 
one of the things that, and also with, with Disney, unless you started out at Disney and unless they pegged you as being one of the, you know, the Glenn Keens or the, or the Andreas, what's his face, you know, unless you were like one of the rock star animators, yeah. Wolf, people like that, Larry White, you were basically going to get a job and stay there. And because I was, I was an excellent effects assistant and they were rarer than hen's teeth. There, there were a lot more good effects animators than effects assistants. And that would have pigeonholed me. I would have been there for, for 30 years. And and then got dumped when they dumped the entire feature unit. Yeah, I would have been dumped with them. So it's probably a good thing you went the path that you did. Well, uh, I mean, for doing effects, yeah, you could do it for Disney for your salary, or and and you would be competing with the greats with Moro Maressa and Jeff Howard for the scenes, right? Who are they going to give the bitchin scenes for the, the scenes where, you know, Pinocchio or uh, the monster of the whale coming out of the water, which was right. Del, by the way, uh, who that? Did that too. Um, you know, me, meanwhile, you could make triple the money. I, I told you I did a lot of the ground shadows in all dogs go to heaven. Yes. I w made a deal with the guy to do at seven bucks a drawing. But people don't realize the ground shadows. That was just like, that's just a thing that you like that was focused on by you. That wasn't the right. So if you yeah. watch All dogs go to heaven and you look at the shadows that are happening from characters on the ground, that's you. Right. Yeah. Right. But it, you know, I mean, it's, you can't like, I mean, I'm not going to hang that on my wall with, you know, and say, like, I did this, you know. Not unless you want to put it next to Peter Pan having his shadow tied back onto his foot, you know. They could... <laughs> well, and, and I, I worked a lot in when, I mean, the animation industry is very cyclical. And there's times when it just would lay down and die. And in the old days of analog, I would drive down into Hollywood and just do live action special effects. And a lot of that was just holdout mats, traveling mats, uh, fixing scenes that they had screwed up. Uh, if they saw your work, you did it wrong. And yeah. so, <laughs> but I mean, fun. It kind of makes the anim animator uh, a bit of a, it's a thankless job in, in that sense, in the term that you, if people are aware of, of you, then you're doing it wrong. <laughs> right, right. But I mean, that a lot of really satisfying, interesting stuff. Well, but, that's well, let's go back in time a little bit to, okay. to uh, we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Klasky Chupo. Klasky Chupo. Klasky Chupo, uh, of course, of course, the uh, guys who provided us with shows like Ah, Real Monsters and uh, Duck Rugrats Man. and Duckman. Duckman's a great one. But I mean, how was it, how was uh, working for them? Because they were a pretty progressive studio, a little bit different than the other ones, weren't they? They, you know what? They're your dysfunctional family. You love them. And you think they're all nuts. They're, yeah. you know, they're, but a lot of times with timing, you're working at home. And I loved them when I worked at home. They would just hand me the animatic and the, and the sheets and the board and you could go to town. And if you added stuff, they would go like, thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's so great. And, um, they wanted you to add things. That's interesting. Yeah. Oh, well, and Gabor was, he's an artist yeah he's he was not a suit gabor really you know and he he had all these these eastern europeans some of whom were completely mad were absolutely insane including igor kovalev who is the uh the creator of real monsters and yeah. he went to gabor and said i want to do the show thought of it you know, it was his idea. And, and that happened a lot there where people would have ideas and say to Gabor, oh, I want to do this. And Gabor would go, great. If it doesn't work, I'll, I'll be pissed. But, you know, it, <laughs> Gabor is, was one of the best people I ever worked for. I have, I have nothing to praise for him. Um, what, was, what was this show? Uh, what, what can you tell us about um, what memories you have from working on Real Monsters? If, if, if there's anything that stands out. I think going in and talking to Igor and having Igor explain like what he was thinking about. Um, when you're, 
it would be like if you uh, worked on the Empire State Building and somebody said, well, I know you did the wall in this office. Uh, what, what, you know, you're part of a team. And I, I don't know. And, and it was 30 years ago and I'm super old, but uh, um, you're like pushing 35 right now, aren't you? So don't worry about that. Well, I don't know. My, my Botox guy won't come out because of the virus, but uh, oh. <laughs> you know, so I got all my, my waddles. Um, <laughs> what I, it was just, it was just fun. And there was like this little group of people, uh, uh, me and Julie Murphy and Mike Lyman and Don Judge and one or two others. And we just did the show. It was so cool. It was like, you know, what part do you have? Oh, I've got that. This is cool. You know, I mean, it was just, I mean, it's, you're doing the little tiny details. It would be like Van Gogh talking about his brush strokes. You know, you're, you're sort of, you're, a lot of times you don't see the forest for the trees because it's so you're, you're doing frames and the show is being shown at, at speed. Right. You know? Um, you don't, you don't actually see the show beyond looking at the animatic, um, for months. How, you know, were you, the, was, how important was this, was the show Bible for you? Was that something that you would refer to regularly or in that, in the timing director role, was that not really something that came up a lot? Um, less of a show Bible, more of interaction between timers. Oh, Okay. You know, the, they were there. What? How many timers were there? There were, like I said, there was uh, Don, Julie, me, oh. Mike. I mean, like in, in general. So like, like would it change? There, there's the different shows have different numbers, but okay. uh, like on Paradise PD, which I just did a, a season of, there was just three of us. That's the newer Netflix show, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that was heaven. Uh, we could, we were working in, uh, um, harmony. Okay. And we were getting the, the animatic and we could actually add moves and add uh, anything we wanted and then just go in and, and talk to, uh, whoever that was directing the show and say like, look, I, I did this. I thought he should do that. And they generally would say like, you know, and that's, that's what you want. That is what you want. You want to like plus things as much as you can. There are other shows where they just say, do it. It's locked in. You're telling the animators when they have to hit the right, the right beat. And that's it. That's your job. Um, less fun usually pays more. Less fun pays more. Why is that? Uh, because those really tightly controlled shows are usually done by the network, by the, by people who care exactly about what, you know, who have it are really maniacal about what they want. There's, there's no play. They're not there to have fun. It sounds, <laughs> <laughs> no, we're working on cartoons, darn it. We don't want to have fun. Uh, what, it sounds like you've met some pretty quirky people personalities and showrunners I would imagine over the years is that a fair oh, yeah I mean that's that's what this business is it it okay. it used to be and still is I mean it attracts people who have spent a lifetime on some of these projects inside their own heads and they sure. you know um Invader Zim is probably very much that way, I imagine, because I know uh, I, I've heard, I've read about Jonan and how he, that's a lot of like he pulled a lot of that from you know his own personal. Absolutely. Absolutely, but I I actually the timing department Nick put us in you know our own little thing, and I it was uh, Steve Russell who was who was the supervising director. I I think I might have said hi to Jonan once or twice. I have no read on him as a person. But uh Steve Russell, who was also like pretty much borderline psychotic. Was, uh, <laughs> he was a great match for that show. He he was excellent for that show. Uh the show he, was psychotic itself, yeah. 
But yeah, yeah, exactly. You want crazy people to work on Invader Zim. I mean, you don't want people that are like, Ooh. right? Yeah, the show doesn't doesn't work when it's timid. That's very true. When, yeah. when you when you're in like now that you're you're in the zone and you've you know you've been in the industry enough years, how does someone how does it apply for a job at a I mean, do you get called and they say we're looking for someone and you're one of five people or is it you have to put your name in a hat kind of a thing? Um, there's so few of us. Okay. That you're generally asked to be on a show. I, I am actually, uh, every so often you have to look for work, but you're looking for work from people who know you. Uh, I just... Uh, contacted Jen Coyle, who I knew from Harley Quinn and about a dozen other shows, and said, you know, if something comes up, give me some work. I mean, there I have like eight or ten people that I just kind of say, and and she'll be, well, I don't know. I mean, now no, there is no lunch room now, right? You know, uh, there's no, there's no, everybody's not like working in the studio, but people talk and they say like, oh shit, I need it, I need a timer. And um, the, a few names come up or the people you want to be the bestest friends with are checkers. Okay. Why that? Well, because they know who gives them the least amount of trouble. And this is also, it's an industry. You're creating a product. You're working on a deadline. You're working on a budget and you're also organizing something you know as much as it's acting it's art and all that but it's also you're organizing your everything has to work together you're the final you're doing the blueprint and the less they erase the less they have to go into the supervising director's office and go like what what is this checkers will kill you or be your best friend they're, okay. they're the ones that are getting your work and they have to ship it. Usually I've always been on the end of the line, like with effects, they would finish animating the show and there would be, then they'd say, Oh, okay. We, you know, now we're going to do the effects because you can't do the effects unless you have the animation. And that's like three days before the deadline you get, you know, I mean, with Dale Bear, we were doing effects on shows that they were down in Hollywood comping and they would run it through. They called it a pro star. They would shoot it and run it through the pro star and ship the film down with a motor a motorcycle messenger to the, while they were comping it. You know, that's usually effects was like right on the edge of the deadline. Same with timing. The only other step before they ship it is checking. And so the checkers usually have a really short amount of time. And if they start getting problems, they don't want to deal with people who give them problems. Um, and the same with directors there. They, I had one director say, if I don't, if you don't see me for the whole season, if I don't hear your name one time, I love you. You're my favorite person. If I hear your name every day, I hate your guts. <laughs> you know? And I said, th that's not just timing. That's a lot of jobs where. What do you. What do you I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, that's all right. I was going to say, what, what do you. Uh, mean, timing timing thing to music, music, timing things for dialogue. Is there one that's uh, more enjoyable for you? Um, no. It depends on the show. It depends on what's going on. It depends on what they want. It depends on w whether I'm on their wavelength. When you're working with people that love your work, it's always fun. When you're working with people that are asking questions about like, why, what, no, it's a nightmare. It can be, I mean, this can be the funnest job ever, or it can be, you can give you a heart attack. I mean, and all of animation is like that. How how much? Uh, how, I mean, how often would you say, like, let's pick one episode of something. Let's say Harley Quinn, because you you've worked on that as well. Uh, 
how many times will you watch one episode before it's before you you're you're all done with it? Usually, there's a production meeting. With Harley Quinn, there was a production meeting because uh, the they had the two supervising directors who were both excellent, and so they would have have maybe the six of us in for a production meeting and they were like really uh cc and uh oh man it's bad uh they they would have they would have us in jen coyle was the supervisor they would have us all in for a meeting and we would watch the animatic without anybody saying anything and then we would go back and they would tell you what your section of it was what your piece of it was and you could discuss like in this, okay, those those things in the background, are their wings going to flap? Uh, you know, you would ask very, very specific questions about the scene, you know, down to like the frame. What what do you want? You know, how, how, do, how do you want to deal with this? And after the first meeting, after you watched it once, after you watched the animatic once, it's not that common to see anything but your section you really are it's a forest and trees thing you're working on the trees okay um and there's a lot of little details like in that like where where she just looked down How, where do you want that to happen she was saying something and she looks down and you know yeah down how do you want those do you want the tears to like stay on the edge of your eyelids or trickle down or run down fast i mean that you know the detail is infinite yeah um which i loved that char the character in the book the detail is infinite you're you're looking at stuff that you're not you're not going to be seeing what when you're sitting back and watching the show but they're going to be seeing it. They they want the whole thing. It all has to match. It all has to be the show. That's right. Yeah. Do you do you get a sense before a show is released that it's going to be oh like oh man I can tell this is going to hit with people really well or or I mean how how, how fine tuned have your predictions of success been over the years? I guess is what I'm asking you. Um sometimes you look at something and just go this is fabulous yeah there is no way this is not going to be you know but i've been horribly wrong i've loved stuff that didn't fly and hated stuff i mean you know there's scooby it's yeah. a guy in a suit okay pretending to be a monster right for years the first thing i ever worked on was scooby and the harlem globetrotters painting oh the dolls you know, and then uh, until until Mike Lyman died, he was the uh, timing supervisor on the, on the new Scoobies. So that was last year. And in that 50 years, I've spent lots of time working on Scooby, never understanding what it is that people loved about that. But getting feedback from regular people. One time when I was done, uh, it was it was animation because I had a pack of model sheets. No, it it was the the ones that um, Chuck uh, Chuck Sheets did around uh, in two thousand, and I had the pack of model sheets, and my son was going with a woman who was one of those one on one aides to an autistic kid, and I said, and she goes, he loves Scooby, he loves Scooby. So I said, well, here's the model sheets. Give him the model sheets. He can color them in or whatever. And she gave him the model sheets and he cried. Oh. Yeah. Scooby had has the most magic connection with its audience. I mean, it's insane. Yeah. yeah. If if I meet people who aren't in animation, that's one of the things I bring up because they go, <gasps> Scooby. Be but like I, I'm with you, Phil. I, I've <laughs> never I've never understood the appeal, especially when you consider how many <laughs> Cat clones that Hanna Barbera turned out of the same formula, whether it be Jabberjaw or the Funky Phantom or the Buggy, whatever his name was, but uh, I, it, they were all doing mysteries. They're all a, a group of teenagers with one wacky character sidekick, and I don't know why that formula worked with Scooby, but you're right. It, it, it's, it's accessible. Yeah, the characters are fun. Yeah, uh, 
you know, that you get to know people. I mean, that no, nobody's, you know, I mean, nobody's really got the formula that works, that catches people, that gets people to say, I have a connection with you. I mean, that's, that's what TV is, isn't it? Sure. And um, nobody's got it. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it don't. And, and, you know, I mean, the same people working the same way and one shows a hit and the other show is, it, it's and some, shows, some shows get a pilot made and a few episodes, but never air any of it. And other ones, I, I, I don't understand. That's the part that still befuddles me. Well, I want one producer that I, that I worked with basically on rock videos, but, um, also on that, the Michael Jackson Moonwalker feature, he oh. had he had in his office Freud's um, comedy and its relationship to the subconscious. And while I was sitting there waiting for him once, I've read one chapter, the one chapter, the first chapter. And if you slipped on a banana peel, I'd be really upset. I mean, God, Phil, are you okay? Or did did you get hurt? I mean, what? Right. Why is that funny when Oliver Hardy does it? big fat guy hits the ground, they go bonk, you know, right. and Freud talks about that. Why, where's the connection that makes that funny in one instance and a horrible tragedy in the other instance, that kind of plays through all the arts. Why do you like uh, the Archies and not like Otis Redding? You know, mm. what is it? You know, they're both doing music. There's a beat. There's, you know, what is it in art? where some of it's just like magic reaches people mm -hmm. it's, and that's, that's in a way, that's what you're working on with timing. Although everybody's working on it in the show, the whole team is working on the faith that you can make that connection, you know, and that's, that's what is so fun. And I, I think I, I, said that in our conversation before it does not always work in fact it generally works less than it 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 doesn't work more than it does work right but when it does work that's the, does that's, work. That's the magic right that's the part it, it's like that's the high that everyone's chasing i imagine is exactly. Exactly. when all of the pieces fall in line and then yep. even though you've worked on it you're watching it and and you're invested in the story even though you you, you already know how to deconstruct it, but if it starts right. talking to you, you're like, right. oh, I have something here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, uh, go off on a different uh, tangent here. Okay. Uh, and I want to invite the audience, uh, people that are watching live right now, if you have a question for Phil Cummings, go ahead and put it in the comments and I'll, I'll try to get to as many as we can here in just a moment. So I'm going to give everybody a chance to do that. And while I give you guys a chance to do that, I'm going to ask Phil about this uh, this book that he has uh, available on Amazon called Sin City High, which I do want to I do want to put a little disclaimer on this part of the of the show and let my audience know that Sin City High is not appropriate for children. I I, I went and looked at a little bit of it, uh, and uh, but I do want to know because it seems like it's a very personal book for you, Phil, um, and and that's I think worth talking about. So can you what can you tell us about Sin City High? It, I went to Valley High in Las Vegas, and I was a kind of juvenile delinquent. It was a sort of uh, misbehavior uh, part of my life. And I started out kind of trying to be true to that, but you're writing fiction. I mean, come on. Right. You've got to, you, you, the, the story is everything in fiction. Um, I wanted to do an updated version of the Satyricon of uh, Petronius 2000 year old novel of the wastrels wandering the streets of Rome, getting up to whatever they could get up to. And, and in that, uh, I, I just, uh, weirdly enough, I just reread it because it's, I think I wrote it 10 years ago when during one of, one of the animation collapses where m people that were formerly my bosses were phoning me up saying, do you, do you know, and um, I want it. I want. I think. I hope that I got. If you're interested in the late '60s, the whole hippie thing, uh, I think that I got that. 
I, I used the 60s as the background and the action takes place. It is a high school dope dealer. Uh, I one, one of the things that I, I used to love was written porn. Okay. Going, going back hundreds of years to the present. And uh, so that's, I mean, that there was, I wanted it to be Tropic of Cancer, Satyricon, uh, those books. And so uh, I went, I went completely crazy. I, I got completely locked into it and uh, I don't know. I had fun. So, what, were you, were you channeling R. Crumb at all or any of the other major artists? Of the time? I, I love us. I love R. Crumb, but it would be like trying to channel Leonardo da Vinci. I think R. Crumb is one of the icons, one of the greats. Yeah. Unfortunately, Fritz the Cat made him where he was going to his grave without ever one other animator ever touching his work, which is heartbreaking to me. Um, that would be if I rubbed the lamp and the genie came up and said, okay, this is it. You won the lottery. What do you want to do? I would want to do first a film of S. Clay Wilson stuff and then a film of R. Crumb stuff. They, they are two that have transcended their genre. There's a good documentary about, about R. Crumb a few years back. Oh, Crumb. Yes. If anybody really, it's really it, it is the best documentary ever made. Yeah. Um, the guy who's talking about his sexual attraction to Bugs Bunny in it, the most serious way. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get deep into the psychosis of, of, of one of the crazy, brilliant minds of, our, of the 20th century. That's Absolutely. Big... I mean, there is. And the fact that his stuff, it's 50 years later, it's still completely. Right relevant you so know someone in the room by the way and it is still relevant yes uh yeah. someone in the room th uh, who's by goes by the name of david cummings i'm not sure if he's a relation to you uh so, yeah i think he might be my brother or okay. he says uh good question for the search of true ai why is slipping on a banana only sometimes funny will ai ever get it i don't know if that's if, if he's i if he's not, i just you know, i just or, had a, i just had a huge problem with ai the uh, movie or just as no, a no the the bots on Facebook. There was somebody posted a video of a cat grabbing a woman the braid on a woman's hair. Okay, and I wrote it was a, a piebald cat, a black and white cat, and I've always thought of black and white cats as being like real crazy, real violent. And so I wrote, black and whites are insane maniacs. And I got flagged on that. They said, that's a racist comment. It's a it's hate speech, right? So I answered it. I said, look at the video and see what I was commenting on, right? And they not only didn't do that, because you're not talking to people. No. They not only didn't do that, they went back and said, a couple of years ago, I had said that white people were stupid and smelled bad. They, they pulled that out of context. And I totally can't remember what I said that about. But it was not hate speech. I don't hate white people. And I don't think that black and white cats, I don't have like, I, there was no rage there, right? But because I wasn't dealing with people, I couldn't say, look at my profile picture. Right. Am I really going to be like hating yeah. on and yeah. look at the video that came with the cat. Context I, is key, everyone. You know, Context is key. You know, AI has no ability for abstract thought, right? Right, right. You falling on the sidewalk and Oliver Hardy falling on the sidewalk is human falling on the sidewalk. Right. You know, the fact that you got hurt and it's real hurt is the bot doesn't know that. They're very true, you know, and hopefully, hopefully they won't uh, enjoy watching us fall and, and get hurt too much because maybe they'll they'll uh, delight in that a little too much at some point. I hope they don't. There, there's no delight there. I mean, that's the weird thing about censorship. If if you could. You know, I mean, even the most crazed censor, I could have said, look, I'm talking about a cat, right? Right. right. You know, check it out. Go go look at the post. 
Yeah. And they would have either said like, screw you. Yeah. Don't talk that way about cats. But it was a bot. It didn't have any way of making a judgment. Right. And that's AI is the danger. I mean, what, you know, whoever wins this, this craziness that we're in is going to have more than the capability of 1984, which I'm glad I'm old. Well, on that, on that, on that somber note, uh, we are out of time for questions, but I, I do want to th uh, remind everybody for. So the only one's my brother. He was the only one watching. Okay. Uh, no, no, he wasn't only watching. <laughs> we're, we're, out of, we're out of time for more questions. Uh, but I do want to remind everybody that if you want to check out Phil's book, you can go to Amazon and look for Sin City High. Uh, you can also go to Phil's website, which I, I might need a reminder on the. It's uh, uh, Phil Cummings art, all one word, all lowercase. Of philcomingsart.com philcomingsart.com excellent phil thank you phil. for coming onto the show <laughs> and i remembered your name I, it's not that difficult when we have the same one as it turns out <laughs> okay well, really, this is really enlightening thank fun. you for for, t for teaching us all about this uh i i assume very little known about department very uh even our bosses don't know in most cases <laughs> what they don't know could hurt them though. <laughs> well, it does. Every so often they try to get rid of timing and they get a thousand retakes and they're sorry. See, there you go. You are a vital cog in the industry <laughs> and we're glad to have you. And thank you once again for being here. All right. Uh, thanks for having me. Right. All right. All righty guys. Thank mm -hmm. you.